Welcome to episode three of the Feminine Mashriq. Today I'm joined by Faiza Kricheni to discuss the 1994 Tunisian film, The Silences of the Palace, by Mufada Tlatli. This is the first feature-length film to be directed by an Arab woman. Enjoy. Hi, Faiza. We are joined with, by Faiza Kricheni. She is a Austin filmmaker and musician. Uh, and I'm, you're a cinephile, I'm assuming. You love movies, right? Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> um, and so you are, you're Algerian and Mexican, right? Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. very cool. So did you, this is a Tunisian film and kind of we were speaking earlier, that's a history that I think I wasn't super duper familiar with. You know, Tunisia is it's, it's quite small. Um, mm -hmm. It, but it borders Algeria. So did you find any like cultural pieces of the film that felt super familiar or I mean also it's like a it takes place in a palace in the 50s so maybe not it might feel pretty far off but yeah you know? not really I mean um definitely like felt parallels um with the French colonization for sure mm -hmm. like a lot of the dialogue that was centered around that was very reminiscent of, you know, hearing about the French Algerian war and the Algerian revolution, um, from my dad, mm -hmm. um, and like reading about it. Um, but like other than that and the food, of course, <laughs> yeah. um, and, and, you know, some of the, the, um, you know, like the party, um, attire was similar to like what I see my family wear in Algeria, like weddings and parties and things of that nature. Um, but the, yeah, the whole, I, we were kind of a little bit touching about this, but the whole, uh, like monarch thing was very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was interesting seeing that, but also reading about it too, since I did read a bit about Tunisia before going into it, but yeah. Yeah. France, France was all over the place in the, uh, early 20th century because they had colonized Lebanon as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's, I love hearing, um, because in, so in the first film that we talked about in this series, Wajib, it takes place in a car and you hear a lot of stuff going on on the radio that they're not necessarily talking about. And this film had that piece to it as well, where we're hearing about, um, demonstrations and protests through the radio. And I thought that that was, that was a really cool way to do it is, it, and just to show the isolation of the people that live in this palace, because the, I think the, the prince and all of his family can leave whenever they want, but the, this group of servant women are stuck there forever. And, and Alia is born there. So she only has her knowledge of the outside world coming through this radio. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really a, a great way to, to sh not show, I mean, to show, not tell sort of, situation yeah definitely I thought that was really interesting too I really liked that as well um because it was just interesting there was one line and I'm I'm not going to remember it perfectly but there was one line at the very end of the film and it doesn't really give anything away so I'm just going to mm -hmm. go ahead and talk about it um when one of the women that um are she's a servant and she says something about how um she wants to that she basically is a prisoner within this palace and how she wants to run in the streets naked screaming and having the bullets go through her body like, like i thought that whole like little bit monologue was just so beautiful but so heartbreaking and just like heavy and intense and very raw the whole film was very raw but it was it was poetic it, you mm -hmm. know it was very poetic and I think it did especially like using the radio you know it's their only connection to the outside world but kind of slipping it in there like it wasn't the main focus and I, and I really love that yeah I really love that about this film it, the the war is going on, but it's not, it's more so following the lives of these, you know, women in their day to day. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and and I I can't remember the name of that character, unfortunately. But she, they paint her in the beginning as just kind of being like a complainer. Like she's every time she talks, the other women are kind of like, okay, like we get it, get over it. But really, everything she's saying is so layered, and and important, and and really where I think Alia gets to by the end of the film is I think at first she's well when she's still like a young girl before she has her first period she's living this pretty charmed life mm -hmm. and, then, and so this woman's narration weaving throughout the film is, is really it feels like what Alia is is starting to feel and wake up to mm -hmm. um and I think I really love I love Sarah's character the the one the girl that's born on the same day as her Mm -hmm. And I like her being, I wouldn't even call her a foil, but she is most likely has the same father as Alia. We don't ever really know, but I, I do think that that's, I think they have the same dad. Mm -hmm. And seeing what life being born legitimately by this man could be. And it's, it's parties and it's old lessons and it's uh, getting to eat upstairs and mm -hmm. just that, and getting a last name, because Alia doesn't have a last name. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's also the way that they kind of paint colorism into that, mm -hmm. because all of the servant women are have brown skin, um, mm -hmm. and, and Sarah and her mother are like very light skinned. Mm -hmm. and, and you see that very much when they're taking the, the portrait of the family and Alia doesn't get to, to join them, which is so, painful and heartbreaking and it's the two shots of the two families and i think that um mufada tlatli just her for this being a first feature film is so shocking <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the shot design and the the color symbolism is so baked in it's so all there yeah for sure yeah i was thinking about that a lot during the film too and also just thinking about you know, the indigenous people of North Africa and like that, um, you know, struggle because my father is, you know, my family, my father's side of the family is from Algeria, but they aren't just Arabs, they're Berber. Mm -hmm. And so my dad is Berber and um, Arab. And so, you know, I've heard a little bit about that from my dad because his first language was Berber and then, you know, mm -hmm. mixing with Arab. And I was, kind of thinking about that throughout the film as well, because some of the women that were servants looked um, indigenous versus, mm -hmm. you know, like, so yeah, that was a constant kind of thread that was in the back of my mind when I was watching the film. And I also thought it was very interesting that um, when they did the family portrait, they were all wearing white and mm -hmm. white signifying like, you know, uh, power and beauty. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I thought that was, really well done and also just like absolutely mind-blowing that this was her first film yeah <laughs> like, absolutely mind-blowing yeah <laughs> it's it is genuinely a masterpiece it is genuinely yeah. a film that i don't know how it should be shown in every film 101 class like mm -hmm. easily it's it's that sophisticated yeah. um but you know, it's it's these films slip by, unfortunately, and yet somehow exist for free on YouTube, which I still right. can't get over how accessible this film is. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also so thankful for it. Um, that's really cool. I didn't I didn't realize that your father's first language was Berber. When did um, how long did he live there in Algeria? He lived. He moved to um, Austin on a scholarship. Okay. to go to college in his 20s and it was this um i'm sure other countries had it but it's a pretty interesting story where he did really well like he had completed like i think one to two years of college already and um all of these algerians and algerian i think from other arab countries in north africa as well got scholarships and it was kind of this government program where the whole deal was you go to america get your degree and then you come back Mm -hmm. but like 99% of them did not go back, including my dad. But when uh, my dad yeah. moved here, he didn't even know English. He like wow. showed up at UT and didn't know English. So he had to be like an English Im immersive classes. That's... At the same time, learning <laughs> engineering. 
<laughs> that's I'm like, so brave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The thought of doing that is just made me start sweating. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. I think another thing that this, well, her shot design really, really shows off the architecture of this palace. So, so much of Southern European and Spanish architecture comes directly from North African architecture. And you absolutely see that in this like incredible palace and just the way that, that the camera moves throughout it is so incredible. Mm -hmm. And the two very distinct layers and, and when Alia and our, our main characters are allowed to go upstairs and how, how that's decorated and lit compared to when they have to stay downstairs. Mm -hmm. And I, I just love that palace. It's so, it's so rich in imagery. Yeah. Yeah. I like want to do a little bit of like research. Like I want to know more about that location and like what it was like and what was it originally. I d actually didn't dive deep into kind of, there's actually not a lot written about the production part of it. It's really hard to find stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I, w I thought that that was very interesting too, especially the way that the camera moves throughout the palace as well. Like just seamless. And when, when was this film? It was 1994. Uh -huh. Yeah. Which is like, I don't know, incredible cinematography and camera work for 1994, but also your first yeah. <laughs> film. Like just going back to that, like the complexity of the shots and like, like you're mm -hmm. saying, like so much attention to detail to the lights, to like what is illuminated in the lights, mm -hmm. how that affects the mood. And like, I know we all know that like lighting affects the mood, but like it was so dramatic. Uh -huh. Like it was, it was, it was, it was Derek, to me it was very intentional symbolism and like mm -hmm. using light to show symbol. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's, there's, there's mm -hmm. so much like glitter to the film. If like, I'm a big eye light person. I love eye lights. I love classical lighting. And all of those close-ups of Alia are just so stunning. Mm -hmm. And and the way her her I mean she's a, both of the the actresses that play that character are are wonderful, but just the way that they've framed it and lit it is mm -hmm. so glittery and beautiful. And yeah, the the tracking shots i don't even know it, it's not even that they were all tracking shots that my favorite shot in the film is the one after um when ali has been in bed for a long time and it's it's following i think it's four or five women they are are working there one of them is washing and two of them i think are are cooking and it like is showing their hands and their faces and khadija just in the background Kind of being somber not knowing what to do and just this like everyday life for these women just working and existing in this place that they don't get to belong in mm -hmm. the, the yeah, music I thought, scene. yeah i thought that i know exactly when they're like in the area that they work i remember when i was actually watching it i thought because i was for a second like i looked down i probably looked at my phone or something and then i looked <laughs> back up and the way that the camera was moving, it was going, it was, it was very unique because typically, right, people are panning down. So it's showing somebody's face and they're panning down to their hands, but it was actually the opposite where it started in the hand and it started panning up, which I thought was interesting because it was, I don't know, it was like moving parallel each time that it went to a new person. So you wouldn't actually know that it was a new person until you saw the object in the hands. And I thought that was very interesting. And also I think hands are just this very intimate thing. We mm -hmm. use them for a lot of, you know, to nourish ourselves, to feed ourselves, to, you know, work. Um, so I thought that was really unique and mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Hands and yeah, because so much, so much of their exploring like service and what it, what it means to that just not because it's not their job it's their life to mm -hmm. to serve at this palace and and Khadija specifically and her telling the story of being sold there 
uh, when she was 10 years old and then becoming the favorite and just growing up there is, is Khadija, I, I love her. She breaks my heart. I think she is um, this beautiful depiction of like maternity and femininity and, and sacrifice. And, and that's why I'm really glad that the film ends the way that it does. And, and I'm, I'm just going to talk like whoever's listening has seen the movie at this point. Um, Cause I just want to talk about the ending and, and Alia deciding that she is going to keep the child that she's pregnant with because she's going to break this cycle of, of loss and of being, of having nothing and being nothing. And deciding like my my mother died so that I could live and I could get out of here and escape and I'm not gonna waste that. Especially because this film was written uh in honor of um Father Tlatli's mother and and her frustration of not knowing where her mom came from necessarily. Her mom apparently was always very vague about her origins. And I think that that Tlatli wanted to to have origins and to let Alia have origins and give her child real origins Mm -hmm. and it's just it's stunning yeah no I mean the film made me think a lot um not necessarily about the film but it, it just brought up a lot of things that I continuously think about my father and about the colonization and about like what my grandfather went through and how he um you know like the main character like the mother um didn't really talk about the strife that they were going through and it was like this secreted experience and yeah i mean i identified with the film on so many levels and especially knowing that you know she made this film you know, as a kind of like, oh, to her mother and like to like being Tunisian and so forth. It just made me think a lot about my own cultural roots as well. Um, So I I definitely get that. The ending is really sad. There were definitely like multiple points in the film where I like just almost cried because it was just, it wasn't that it wasn't, it wasn't that it was so emotional and it's like tugging at your heartstrings, but it's like, this is real. Like this really, like, even if this story is fictional, like this really happened and it's told in this like beautifully poetic way. And the end, I mean, obviously like I wasn't born in the 1950s, but <laughs> like, at the end, I very much identify with Alia because she's a musician and she like always was thinking outside the box and like, um, you know, had like this wandering mind where she was just like questioning things and like d- didn't really fully understand, well, why can't I play with Sarah's instrument kind of thing, you know? Like, so yeah, I know I just went on a tangent, but like, <laughs> no, yeah. no, no, that's, I love that. Um, and, and so much, uh, the reason that I wanted to screen this series so much is because I knew so many people would be able to connect to it and be like, Oh yes, there we go. There's myself in a film. Um, mm-hmm. What is Oud in English? Um, the the guitar thing. Um, lute? Maybe. It started with an L for sure. Okay. So I'm like, I only know Oud. I only know that word. Um, the instrument. <laughs> we'll yes. just say, we'll put it that way. The instrument. All of the stuff happening around the instruments. When her mom shows up with that thing, that, that did break me. I did start openly crying when her mom showed up with that instrument and was like here you go because their relationship is so lovely I feel like I see a lot of films where mothers and daughters struggle and it just it can feel really laborious I think it can be like this is a lot of butting heads and this is a lot of not getting along and this relationship was so sweet and it was her just being like I know what happens when you become a woman in this palace and I'm not letting it happen to you and, and you're not supposed to be a musician, but I'm not letting that happen to you either. Right. Yeah, it was all like, I felt like the entire film, their relationship for sure, but the entire film was just so real. Like mm-hmm. it was just so real. And like, you know, the, the mother and the daughter 
butting heads, but it wasn't like this over the top drama. It was like the little bits of everyday life and how that intersects with like culture and religion Mm -hmm. and like, um, you know, the hierarchy and like all of those things. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, the scene, that's actually something that I was thinking of, um, when I was watching it is like, even Sarah having the instrument, I was like, that's interesting because I, I just, I don't know, like culturally in, in Algeria, like I've never really thought about that. Like women aren't really, I guess in my direct family and my direct experience, like musicians are like drawn to music or singing or things like that. So it was very interesting to see that on screen because it's not I guess a character or like a type of person that I was used to seeing in the context of like, you know, the Arab world, just generally. No, for sure. Um, Yeah. And it's not like she's like, Sarah is not an entertainer. She's not learning to become an entertainer. She's doing it because she's a, you know, I guess she's technically, is she a princess technically? Yeah. Yeah, she's a, you know, royalty, and she, that's that's what you do when you're royal, is you pick up skills. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I really liked that. Also, the singing was just so beautiful. Oh, oh she's and, good. And, yeah, and it also just reminded me of, like, the, the entire film, you know, and I'm sure you feel this way too, like, it just reminds you of things with your family, and it's just so it's like very touching when you see it on screen because it's not represented in cinema, just generally, right? In, mm-hmm. in American cinema. Um, and so like, it would just make me, remind me like her singing was so beautiful and like, I appreciate, you know, Arabic music so much now, but when I was growing up, I was so embarrassed when my dad would pick me up from school and like roll down the windows and have that shit blaring. <laughs> I don't want people to know that we're like, to me, like being like having a, having a parent that wasn't, you know, that was an immigrant was like embarrassing. You know, I was embarrassed. I wanted to be like the American kids. So when my dad would like pull up in his SUV, just, I, know, I knew he just did it to irritate me too. Right. Like, of course. You know, he of didn't course. Roll down the windows. <laughs> but like then hearing it, you know, like, 15 years later as an adult I'm like oh my god it's so beautiful I should have been like fuck yeah dad like that's amazing (laughs) you know like I'm proud like awesome yeah it's a very it's a different way of even just singing because I after I watched this movie I was trying to sing like her and I was like I can't do that I don't know how to do that (laughs) yeah it's so beautiful though Mm -hmm. um and it's interesting the the respect that, at least at first, because we were led to believe that she is not a very successful singer in adult life. She kind of is like a wedding singer and sings at clubs and stuff. But her singing was very highly respected in the palace, but her mother's dancing was not. Her mother's mm-hmm. dancing was for men and for the male gaze. And it meant that she, it made her property. But singing was a beautiful gift. Right. And then to have her at Sarah's engagement party kind of panic. And, and I think that there's, because during the engagement party is when her mother is miscarrying. And so I think that there is like this kind of like cosmic familial link. And I think that she feels that shift happen and that's why she starts singing that political song and that band song and and committing fully to it and being like, I'm done with this. And it's yeah. a really beautiful act of revolution to have this yeah. thing, this gift that was allowing what was oppressing her because by having her be forced to sing and at parties and stuff and then being like, well, now I'm going to use my gift to tell you to fuck off. Yeah so lovely yeah Yeah, that part of the film like even just you talking about it right now because I'm like revisiting it and the images in my head that was one of the parts that almost just like made me start crying because it was just so moving and it was also just so 
it was just so amazing. And it just reminds me of this band that I'm a huge fan of, and they're from New York. And the singer is uh, Lebanese. Um, his name is Nader, and uh, they're called Haram. Um, nice. which is forbidden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he sings in Arabic, but it's a punk band and he like, you know, so he gets in front of all of these people and like uses air, you know, uses the Arabic language and like, I don't know, it just reminded me like, to me, that was just like punk as fuck of like Alia to be like getting up there, having that moment of silence, probably like freaking out and being like, am I going to do it? Am I going to do it? All right, I'm going to fucking do it. And then yeah. just like and then the people walking out and she just continues and I'm just mm -hmm. like I don't know that scene was just so moving like I could just watch that a hundred times <laughs> yeah absolutely it's so beautifully done mm -hmm. um also the the costumes in that scene you kind of had touched on earlier the costumes are so beautiful as well that white dress I would wear right now um it's, it's so good yeah, for sure. I keep asking, like, because my, I have a whole family that lives in Algeria, and I talk to them on social media, and, like, they wear some really badass stuff, like, they have, and I don't know what the proper name is, so forgive me, but it's, like, a nose ring, but then it has the chain that goes to your ear, mm -hmm. but they have, like, double ones, and I'm, like, yo, can y'all, like, like, mail me? <laughs> yeah. um, but they're supposed to. I'm like, their clothes are just like for like uh, celebrations and things are mm -hmm. just amazing. Um, but one thing that I thought was interesting in in the in the scenes where they are not, um, where it's not like a celebration, like some of the women were wearing hijabs and some of the women were not wearing hijabs, and mm -hmm. that's something like in Algerian culture they do not wear hijabs if they're just like at home or um like weddings and stuff like they you know they dress um pretty similarly to the way that they were dressed there but any other time they're wearing them and I thought that was interesting too like when the family is coming back like when they got in the car and then you see them exit like the women are just they're just different than I'm I guess used to seeing as well right yeah that yeah and that's little kind of details that are really nice to see included for sure um one thing i couldn't tell was the teacher her boyfriend at the beginning yes yes okay it is. Mm -hmm. all right because i also had like my own little thing about that where i was like this guy is a lot older than her. She's like mm -hmm. 15 years old. And like, I don't know. And I, so I was, that whole situation, it's like, made me a little uncomfortable where I was kind of like, she's a child. Like she yeah. is literally a child. And like this, this man is like, you know, in love with her or whatever, infatuated with her. And so I couldn't tell if it was the same actor or it was supposed to be the same character. I didn't put it together, but I had a feeling it was so that was like one thing that also I was like thinking a lot about and then obviously Sarah being wet off at 15 years old as right. well right <laughs> not yeah. not a great practice uh yeah. for this family um yeah the teacher is interesting because he's supposed to be kind of like a radical kind of revolutionary but then he comes in and is kind of just as gross as all the other guys that are there. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure how intentional that was supposed to feel. I wasn't sure if it was just trying to be a like, yeah, in the fifties in Tunisia, it's not, it wasn't inappropriate for an adult man with a career to date a 15 year old and marry a 15 year, 15 year old. Um, or if they were touching on like, yeah, like, these radicals were still just trying to fight for, for men, the men and not the women as well. Um, so yeah, that was a piece of like maybe culture and history that I didn't quite have and wasn't sure about. Um, but the whole yeah. time in my head, I was rationalizing. I was like, okay, she's 15. Maybe he's like 18 or something. Maybe he's a really young teacher, but no, he's not. He's an adult man. 
and because yeah. I wanted to like him I was like oh he's cute he's he's teaching her how to write and I was like yeah and he's still being massively inappropriate and yeah. and this poor woman and I think in the way I read the film is I don't think she's going to stay with him I think that yeah. she, when she decided that she was going to keep her child because he's the one who's like we can't keep we can't keep the child you, we have to be married to keep the child um I think when she decided that she wasn't going to do that in my head, I was like, I think she's going to leave him and she's going to start over new because her mother raised her without a father and they did great. Like they had a successful relationship as mother and daughter. And I think she, that's a way that she's going to honor her mother and be like, my mom did a great job with me and I can do the same thing. Yeah. 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 I thought, I think that that's very interesting. Um, and also important to point out is during, um, you know, the revolution, and again, speaking with Algeria, is that there was um, an uprising with the women there that were like, oh, okay, so you're fighting for independence, and that's awesome, but you want us to not be independent, and so fuck you, you know, can I guess on this? I'm, I'm yes, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. like, fuck you you need to include us and like we need to be a part of this uh revolution as well and so um yeah i definitely feel like there was and i mean i would love to like talk to the filmmaker is the filmmaker is the director still alive i believe so again it's not super easy i was looking for interviews with her on video and i found a lot of french filmmakers talking about her but i couldn't find any of her okay but I do believe she's still alive. Okay. Because, yeah, I definitely think that there is, it, with everything being so meticulously planned in this film, I feel like there is an inherent reason to show that relationship, not it just being like, a, you know, I do not think the director was, and the writer, she was a writer as well, mm -hmm. um, um, was trying to do the whole trope of like the man saving the woman like definitely mm -hmm. was not what it was going for so yeah i'm interested to like dissect that even further i'm gonna do some deep digging yes <laughs> and yes find out more. but yeah yeah i it was fun because i was reading some digitized reviews that were like in newspapers and stuff and and that was fun but it is it's for being as massive as this film is and as again, sophisticated as it is, it's weird that it's hard to track down things about it. Right. And, and there are definitely a decent amount of write-ups, but there's just not like a ton of interviews with the cast and crew. Mm -hmm. um, I did find out that the younger, the younger actress that played Alia, I think also wrote and edited Blue is the Warmest Color or something. Which oh, is wow. was a thing I figured out. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, which was a weird piece of information. I actually haven't seen that film. Yeah, but... I haven't seen it either. Um, but that's interesting. I also read, because I was doing some uh, a little bit of research about the film, that the, the director um, was an editor before. Yes, yeah. She had, I think, a pretty decent amount of stuff under her belt as an editor. And so that kind of makes more sense, I guess, as to why the like shot design is so solid, but still there's, I've seen people who've directed multiple films that are none of them being as good as this one. <laughs> right. She's just got it, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was amazing. And going back to the teacher, that scene where she is writing her name and then she doesn't have the last name, but like, legitimately like the little details of the film like if you look at the chalkboard one side is french and the mm. other side is arabic and i was just like yes like my dad had to learn how to write you know uh left to right and right to left you know right. and like different different languages and stuff and i i feel like yeah i i really love this series because i feel like Arab cinema just in general in America is definitely undervalued and like the histories of you know the colonization that has been 
deeply rooted in Arab culture for like generations and generations is not taught, you know, like mm-hmm. people don't know about it. People know Battle of Algiers and we'll talk about Battle of Algiers all day, every day. And it's like, that film's great, but also, well, I haven't seen it, but I've heard the film's great. I refuse to watch it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but like also it's like about the trauma and like this right. film wasn't focused on like, I mean, it did have, you know, trauma, but it wasn't solely focused on, you know, brutalizing people, you know, right. it was more about like, this is their life. And I think that's why I connected with it so much. Cause I was just like, is this how my family was, you know, like right. in a way. So yeah. Right. Yeah. And that was so important uh, for me to not program films about very explicitly about war and poverty. Um, because just turn on the news from 2001 to 2010 if you want to see Arab countries in war and poverty. Like, that's, that's what so much of Western media wants to show. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was so excited to be able to program, like, it's a melodrama. It's like a film that's in a genre that oftentimes isn't the most respected. Um, and it's the best melodrama I've ever seen. Like, it's mm-hmm. so good. Um, it's, it still feels so incredibly realistic, and it feels so just very grounded. It's a grounded film, even though it is literally about a palace. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. princes. Right. <laughs> this movie is, in a lot of ways, about a war and a revolution, but just not in a way that's traumatizing or exactly. lingering too long on hurt people because mm-hmm. I'm it's just it's I'm very uninterested in that narrative right. and I'm yeah. I'm done with it because I had to grow up with Homeland being the uh, one of the most popular tv shows and mm-hmm. and stuff like that so I'm over it um but yeah I do think that this is such a stellar film and so crazy that it's so accessible and it just it's people should really be taking advantage of that more I mean all of these films the past two films were free on YouTube and then the other one was free on Amazon it's like yeah that's just wild that they're just these films are hanging out in these places um especially because so many of these films have been kind of a lot of the films that I initially thought I was going to show I haven't been able to access Because when we initially thought of the idea for this film series, it was going to be uh, in person. And I was just going to like rent all of the movies. And then we were just going to screen them that way. And so it was an extra challenge to have to be able to stream all of them. Mm -hmm. But then there was, there was some little pieces of little gems hanging out for free on the internet. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I actually want to look at the person that put the video on YouTube's YouTube to see yeah. what other films they've put on because not only did they put it on YouTube, but they also subtitled it in English. So like, uh-huh. you know, like I want to know like who are you? Are you like a film archivist? Like are you like what do you do? Right. I, I didn't really pay attention to the like username or anything, so I didn't know. I just like watched it. So right. I'm interested um and that for sure and like it's interesting with me because like I have this like identity battle constantly because I'm half Mexican and I'm half Arabic and my father passed away in 2014 and so he was basically the only person that I had um in Austin that is my family from my Algerian side all like literally all the rest of them live in Algeria and so um And also he just wasn't really open about a lot of things. Like he actually was a um, child when the, when it was the French Algerian war and his father was fought for, you know, with the Algerian resistance. And so he doesn't like to talk about it. And so everything that I've kind of like dove into has been kind of my own doing. And so I actually, you know, don't really know that much about, Algerian cinema, which is, I need to, I just never, you know, everybody has to work because of capitalism. So I don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel you on that. Yeah. I mean, but... there's so, so many wonderful Algerian films. Um, 
mostly directed by men. Um, but there's a lot of really phenomenal Algerian films um, that at the, at the end of this series, at, at the wrap up, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to compile a list of things that didn't necessarily fit into this specific category, but are other just Arab films that I think are necessary. Um, and I'll definitely send that to you. Yeah, I would love to check it out because I need, I loved this film so much. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's so stellar. Not even just for this series, not just because it was by an Arab person, not just because it was by a woman. It is just one of the best films I truly believe ever made. Yes. Yeah. It's technically crafted so well. It's acted so well. The production design is incredible. The story is good. Like it's, and the thing is, is you don't need the specific context to understand the film. Because I watched it with my partner who is a white American man who didn't know much about Tunisia at all. And he loved it. And he didn't need that connection uh, mm -hmm. to, to feel something from the film. And I think yeah. that's really the testament of a really phenomenal film. Yeah, I definitely agree. I wish I would have watched it sooner. And I, it's one of those films too, where I'm continuously, I keep thinking about it and I keep thinking about not just like, oh, that part was really good, but just like generally just the imagery, like the images that like are kind of burned into my head. Like, like what you were saying, like the shots, um, the, like the close up shots of their faces and the shadows and the lights and the tears and their eyes and the, refle the reflections, like the mirror yeah. scenes, like mm -hmm. so much of it. It was just like so beautiful. And also it all takes place in one location, which yeah. I also think is just like, and you know that this war is happening, but you actually never see it. And you, I don't know. So you start painting your own pictures while you're watching it. It's just very immersive, I guess, is the word yeah. I'm looking for. Well, and uh, with Shireen, my guest from the first podcast, she brought up a really good point about how poetry is so important in the Arab world and the Middle East in general. And you really can see that in these films, especially this film, is the visual poetry is, is all there. It's, it all feels intentional. Uh, she lets you sit with, with people and with objects for, for a, a decent amount of time. Um, the editing is, is very lingering. It's, we're not just like chopping around. It's, it's doesn't need to be fast paced. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it does, it reads like poetry. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Do you know if the song, the political song that she sings is that a real song? Is, was that like a real song or was it created for the film? I think it was a real song, but I would have to double check. Um, Cause it had really cool lyrics. <laughs> yeah, it was solid. Yeah, it was really yeah. good. I will, I yeah. will look that up and I'll edit it into the podcast if it was real or not. Or, well, I mean, it's a real song now, but, or if it was yeah. a song for the revolution or for the film. Mm -hmm. Um, I, this movie also did a really good job of completely making me forget that it was 1994. Like, yeah. all of it was so, I kept thinking that it was, like, the early 70s or something. Yeah. Um, and that's really hard to do. That's so hard to make a period piece and make you really forget that it's a period piece. Yeah. No, I definitely agree with that. And I actually like, again, like was like kind of double checking on my phone being like, wait, was this 1994? This was 1994. Like even the colors, like the mm -hmm. muted colors, like it reminded me, the like color palette reminded me very much of that, that other film that we watched in the little Instagram group that you had. Um, shit. What is um, it watched it? No. No. Uh, Oh, my film? No. No. <laughs> the film that we watched because you recommended it. And it was 1970s and it followed a, Mor uh, a Moroccan man and he moved to Germany. Oh, that was Catherine's film. Um, oh, oops. Uh, Al uh, Ali Fear Eats the Soul. Yes. The color palette reminded me yes. of that film, which that film was shot in the 70s. So like, right. you right. know, yeah. So, and that was like the period of time. So. Anyway, yeah, I think, yeah, that was really well done. That's a really good point. It was 1994. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they yeah. did a really good job. Keep reminding yourself, it's 1994. It doesn't feel like it, but it is. 
Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, there would be points when I would like look up what the actors were doing now and just being like, oh yeah, they're like still actively <laughs> making films and like, oh yeah, they're going to be in three films next year. <laughs> like, cause yeah. it was 20 years ago. Well, almost 30, but <laughs> yeah. Still. No, sure. Yeah. And then I think that just goes back to the film just being the best film, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> just like fully immersing you, like, um, yeah. that you forget, like, oh shit, it's 2020 and there's a fucking pandemic, <laughs> you know, you're just like fully immersed into this yeah. beautiful work of art. Right. You're like, I'm going to go s- take a nap on the grounds in the palace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go sleep now in the right sun. Here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's interesting that you ta- that you remember your dad being more quiet about Algeria and this film is about silence and and I think that there it feels like cultural of of I think specifically North Africa uh, being quiet about traumas and not lingering with it and and culturally it's like if if you ask an Arab person, like, how are you doing? It's like, it's always like, alhamdulillah. Like, it's, I'm good. I'm good. God is good. It's never, it's never like, well, let me tell you at first. It's, it's, God is taking care of me. Everything is good. And it's this aspect of silence that it's, it's interesting to make a movie about silence and also about a singer (laughs) and about music. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, and I see those parallels too in, in my Mexican side as well Mm. like I feel like you know countries that have been colonized by Europeans um often I mean I guess that's the whole fucking world (laughs) Um, but like but like you know I I also get that from my other side too so you know it isn't until my mom has gotten older that she has gotten has uh been open about her emotions but my dad was never really open about it. And it was interesting because I never met my grandfather. He died um, before I was born, Um, but my mom did. And like, even recently she was telling me a story about my grandfather who again, never met, or maybe I was a baby. I I don't remember. Um, But she told me like, he didn't talk much. Mm -hmm. And I was like, really? And I was like, is it because he didn't know English? (laughs) And she was like, (laughs) She was like, well, yeah, but, <laughs> like, <laughs> and um, she was like, yeah, I really think that the war, because he was, you know, a prisoner of war, he was mm-hmm. tortured, um, my father was, like, a small child at the time, um, and so he just, like, never really talked about it very much, but then my dad, he was, like, kind of a small guy, like, um, in, in height, like, all my uncles on my Algerian side are, like, six two, like, they're, like, huge huge humans but my dad was like five seven and people would always tease him about it in America and I guess when him and my mom were together the only thing that he ever told her about this period of time was um yeah we just didn't have enough to eat and so he wasn't like eating enough you know during these periods of time when you're supposed to be nourishing your body and you're growing and you're a little kid and so that just like really broke my heart um so, like, th- the food, like, in the film, like, them putting together these lavish meals for these people, but then you don't ever really see the servants eating mm-hmm. in, in the film. Yeah, so that's I a good that point. Interesting as well, um, like, food and insecurities and things like that. And one of the first, one of the first conversations we have with the group of women is them laughing that he wants to eat food, which is a, a bean dish that poor people eat. And she's like, oh, he wants to eat like, like the, he wants to eat like the poor. Why doesn't he come eat down here with us then? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really, it's such a good line. It's such a good moment. Yeah. Um, that is true. We really don't see them eating that much. Mm, and we see the, the people upstairs eating a lot. Yeah. I mean, we like, see them at a lot of meals. Yeah. yeah. Like 90% of the time they are eating right. or drinking. Right, right, or yeah. or getting tea brought to them. Mm. Man, interesting. And I, I think another thing to point out is this specific 
monarchy, these princes are in conjunction with the French. Like, I think they are, they have benefited from the colonization and they're really wanting uh, the revolution to not happen because then they're going to get their power taken from them. And, and that's pretty hush hush. They don't, that's not talked about a lot, but that's the reason that this revolutionary song is so upsetting to them and, and why they're so heart, or the, the main prince is so heartbroken that Alia leaves and gets engaged to this revolutionary radical teacher. Yeah, I thought that that was very interesting too. I think that that, you know, that's something that can even correlate to us in America as well. And like, just like class structure in general and like people in power, like sometimes it goes beyond culture. And, so, and if you strip it away, it mm -hmm. all goes back to money and, and who has the money and who has that power. So I thought that was very interesting. And I also want to like do research again um, about it to see if that like correlates with actually like how it was, you know, or if that right. was a fictional storytelling or something of that, because I, I found that very interesting. And I haven't seen another movie, like now that I'm thinking about it, like just in general of that power structure. Right. Of, you know, so I thought that was really interesting, but but yeah, it's like this hush thing where it's kind of like happening in the background and you know it's happening, but it's not necessarily the focal point, but it's also informing the way that you're viewing the characters. Mm -hmm. So it's like very complex. Right. So, yeah, Layered. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which I, I love that. I know some people love our very straightforward time, but I like something that you have to really dig around in. Uh, yeah. cause even the second viewing of the film, I got so much more out of it. There were so many, cause it, it's really, it unfolds cause you don't, they do a very good job of, you don't know who anyone is at first. And when you, when I went back and watched that first scene again of her arriving at the palace and you're like, Oh, I understand every single one of these looks now. I understand why things just got tense and why everyone is jarred seeing her back in this palace. Yeah. So. No, I definitely, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no. The, I oh, was okay. Just, uh, oh. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, I definitely agree. I actually, in the very beginning, within, like, the first, like, three minutes, I was like, do I need to rewind this and watch this again? Because I feel a little lost. But I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep watching it. And you're right. Like, you do not know who anyone is. Mm -hmm. And, like, and at first I was like, wait, is the flashbacks about to happen? Or, like, you know, <laughs> right. so I, I've only watched it one time. I want to watch it again because I want to, I want to know those looks you're talking about. Cause I didn't really get it. You know, I was trying to just like put it together in those first couple minutes. Right. Um, and it's really interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a film that has two different actors play a character when they're that close in age, because I think, cause it's 15 and 25. And I think in most films they would just put, they'd make one actor to look 15 and then to look 25. Yeah. And so for a second, I found that confusing too. Cause I was like, wait a minute, these are these sisters. Cause they do look very similar, but I can't tell if they're the same character or not. Um, and I do like that they did that. I think it's really interesting, but it was on the first reading. I was a little confused at first because I'm so used to a particular visual language. Yeah, I definitely thought that too. And I was like, oh, wow, they both have like the same mole in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, it's the same person. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Two, maybe it's an Arab thing. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do you have one? <laughs> I do, yes. Oh, shit, maybe it is. Mine, I'm wearing foundation, but right here. Yeah, here. <laughs> maybe it is. Maybe it, it is. is. Yeah. Um, let us know, listeners. Just kidding. Hey, listeners, <laughs> call in. Let us know if you have a, a mole on your upper lip and you are an Arab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I'm turning red now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Well, <laughs> I think um, we're going to start wrapping up, unfortunately. Was there anything else that we didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about with the film? It's a um, dense movie. There is, yeah. we could talk for hours about it, but. I definitely feel like we could talk for hours about it. Um, I would just say, if you're listening to this, 
I would definitely watch this film because it's absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and it definitely like left an impression on me and I want to watch it again. And it's definitely yeah. not for the faint at heart though. Like if, yes. you're, if you're in an emotional place, I would, which I think we all are um, for various reasons. Yeah. But definitely just know that going into it, that it's, it's heavy. Yes. It's very heavy. It is not lighthearted. I would say it is, it is um, not gratuitous, which I really appreciated. Um, and I think felt very much like a woman's touch uh, to film the way that things were filmed. Um, but that is a really good point. Thematically and visually, there is some, some hard themes that are getting touched on. Um, but if, if you're in a place where you feel like you can handle that, it, please check this film out. It's so good. It's such an important film. Um, I just need it to be in the zeitgeist. I need to be able to reference this film all the time. Like, next time I make a movie, I'm going to be like, remember that one shot in <laughs> Silences of the Palace? We need to do that one. Um, but yeah, for sure. Um, where can people find you? Um, they can find me. Um, where can they find me? They can find me on Instagram, um, um, at Punk Princess, but uh, Princess is spelled with a V and not with an I. Um, and also I am over at the Austin School of Film. So if you, um, take any workshops or anything online, likely you will see me. And I also strongly encourage anyone in Austin. Oh, no, just kidding. Everything's virtual now. Woo. I suggest <laughs> everyone do, uh, the Austin School of Films workshops because I've done like three or four of them and they're really rad. And FaZa kicks ass uh, scheduling and programming these things and bringing in some really amazing panelists um, for either free or very little cost. And film school is expensive, y'all. Y'all should jump on this because FaZa is the queen of making this accessible. And I am so thankful to know her. Thank you. <laughs> for real, though. For real, though. Okay. Well. Uh, this, thank you so much for joining me. This was such a lovely conversation. Um, thank you for bringing so much of your personal and family stuff to it as well, because I think that that helps add some context and and feel special to me that to, to connect with you over this film. Yeah, thank you for having me too. Yeah, well, we'll talk yeah. soon. Yeah. All right, bye. Bye.